This presentation was recorded at the 2015 ANZICS ACCCN Annual Scientific Meeting. Welcome to the core session. Um, I was at a dinner the other day and someone said <coughs> ANZICS has got two fantastic assets. Um, the first is the ANZICS CTG and the second is core. And I think that's probably true. They're the, they're the things that internationally make us a society that um, uh, is now held in high standing. And <coughs> since I've been uh, following research and outcomes in intensive care, um, one person has been uh, one of the driving forces, one of the engines inside CORE that has helped it produce outcomes, understanding why we have outcomes that are as they are and the resources that we consume when we produce our outcomes is obviously a key part of understanding what we're doing now and what we have been doing and that guides us towards where we're going to go in the future. So David Pilcher from the Alfred in Melbourne is one of the driving forces behind CORE. Uh, he's been there a long time. He's done a lot of fantastic work uh, and I'm sure most of you already know him uh, or certainly know of him. So without much further introduction, uh, I would like to introduce him to give his first talk, How Do You Tell If Your Cardiac Surgeon Is Any Good? Cheers, Tony. That's a very kind introduction. Um, <clears throat> as Tony says, I'm David Piltar. I work with a whole load of individuals at CORE. Um, and hopefully what you're going to see today is some examples of some kind of outputs that come predominantly through the re research that comes out of all the different arms of CORE and there's a huge number of people heavily involved and staff who work very hard within the actual sort of organisation at Anzic House uh, and in Brisbane. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, this really isn't a very fair uh, title really, um, <laughs> it, it should be but I couldn't resist putting it like this because I thought a bit of tabloid would be, might get more than three people in the room. Um, <coughs> It should be, how, how, how might we tell if your cardiac, cardiothoracic unit is performing within um, acceptable modern standards? Um, <coughs> we, uh, and <coughs> to sort of introduce a concept that we've de developed, which, which might be a way of, mo of monitoring cardiac surgery. <coughs> We heard this morning, um, I really enjoyed Andrew Wolfe's talk this morning about the Bristol Royal in, uh, Infirmary Inquiry. Um, <coughs> cardiac surgery, 60, 60 years ago, the mortality was very high. Cardiac surgical outcomes nowadays are very are massively improved, and <coughs> you expect a mortality of sort of 1, 1.5% for, for most cardiac surgery. For routine, a routine coronary artery bypass graft, the mortality in most hospitals now is actually less than 1%. But if you go back over the history of cardiac surgery, um, <clears throat> the history of cardiac surgery has a number of episodes where people have looked at where there have either been technical advantage, uh, advances or there have been um, advances that have come out of serious events. The most obvious example of that that we heard about this morning was the Bristol Inquiry. And the Bristol Inquiry not only read to, led to a, a lot of um, interest in cardiac out, monitoring cardiac outcomes, but the processes around cardiac outcomes, but also generated a whole field of research. And Andrew referred to this this morning and talked about a guy called David Spiegelhalter, who's really become the professor of monitoring medical outcomes, measuring mortality, measuring risk, and most of those have been applied through monitoring cardiac surgical outcomes. Um, the picture that I put in the middle is a book that I'd actually recommend. It's, just, it's actually recently been published. It's by the, the, a, a guy who's a cardiac surgeon from um, Papworth, and he's the, he is the surgeon that developed the Euroscore. And uh, if only for the, for the quote at the beginning, and the quote at the beginning is there are three types of doctors, those that can count and those that can't. And <laughs> but he details, he goes through a whole load of stories around how the improvements in cardiac surgery have, invo have evolved, but not only how they've evolved, but how they've been monitored. The development of the Euroscore, the, the, the developments that happened in monitoring cardiac surgery after the Bristol Inquiry. Um, and 
also spends a fair bit of time describing how good cardiac surgical outcomes are. If you compare a mortality now of less than 1% for routine and elective coronary artery bypass surgery to mortality rates of 40% 50, 60 years ago, you have a huge improvement. However, <clears throat> if we now have a mortality of 1%, which is great, um, it actually becomes quite hard to compare outcomes. Cardiac surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, and I'm, at the moment I'm basically just talking about valve surgery and coronary artery bypass surgery, is a big component of what we do. There's about 15,000 patients admitted to Australian and New Zealand intensive care units <coughs> per year. It's 15 to 20% of our workload. It's about the same proportion in private as it is in, in uh, tertiary public hospitals, and the tertiary hospitals account for t probably about two-thirds of the overall um, <clears throat> of the overall numbers. But because the mortality is so low, even when you risk adjust it and you plot it on a funnel plot, and this is a funnel plot of the last year of cardiac surgery, <clears throat> the competence intervals are so wide that you can't, you, using mortality to actually demonstrate variation <clears throat> is actually quite hard because there isn't much change in, there isn't much variation in mortality. You just, everyone sits within the funnel plot nowadays. Um, <clears throat> but that's not to say the different cardiac surgical uh, that there is variation in cardiac surgical outcomes. There's also the capacity to um, get away with, uh, with without having exemplary practice if you just look at cardiac uh, mortality outcomes. You know, it's, and I'm not suggesting that surgeons would do this or that cardiothoracic units would do that. But if you say, yes, yeah, so we have a, a high number of strokes this year, but or. Uh, a prolonged duration of ventilation, but our mortality is okay, it actually removes the focus away from what is now a considered, well, are now considered very important outcomes because they're morbidity outcomes. If we've now got mortality down to a low enough point, morbidity becomes the important outcome that we need to look at. So <clears throat> we thought we'd try and sort of look, take this a little bit further and actually you, see if we could work out some way of looking at this. Um, <clears throat> Who here looks after cardiac surgical patients? Hands up. Okay, the majority of patients. Have you stood by the bedside of a patient who arrived back from theatre and looked at them and thought, this person is sicker than I think they should be? Yeah, all of us have at some point. Absolutely, absolutely. That was the concept that sort of that got us thinking. Um, so what we did was, obviously, we have the ANZIC score data, we've got the adult patient database, but there's an Australian New Zealand cardiothoracic registry. So we got together with them, and both registries have their own scores. We have an Apache score when people arrive in ICU. The cardiothoracic registry have an OZ score, which is the Australian, um, now Australian New Zealand equivalent of the Euro score. Um, both of those scores give you a risk of death. But they give you a risk of death at two separate time points. They give you the risk of death when the person comes into the hospital. And they give you the risk of death when the person turns up in the ICU. So <clears throat> a person who comes in as a low-risk patient when they come in the, in the hospital should be a low-risk patient when they turn up in the ICU. If they're not, if they're a high-risk person when they turn up in the ICU, presumably something has not gone as well as it should do. That's the patient that we th think of, the patient that I got you to think about a moment ago. <clears throat> and we have those two numbers. They're literally, we have them as a number. So all we've done is we've just taken one number, the risk of death here when the person turns up in the ICU, away from the risk of death here. So if that number goes up, that patient has got sicker. So we thought, well, okay, does this work? Is this useful? Is this concept? Does it make sense? It makes sense to me in the sort of general terms to think of a patient who is you know, moderately sick here and if they're more sick here when they turn up in the ICU, but now we've actually got a number that we can quantify. So we started looking at it. We actually c came up with an acronym of the Acute Risk Change, because it is a change in risk in cardiothoracic admissions to intensive care, ARTIC. Of course, after we that we realise there's about seven different people who've come up with ARTICs for different types of things as well, but for, for the moment it's ARTIC is what we've called it. <clears throat>
And what we did was we, we linked data from the, from the two registries. Um, we've done this twice now, actually. So initially we linked up uh, eight, 19 hospitals, actually, and then we got later data from uh, 23 hospitals. And we got about 25,000 patients that we could link between the two data sets. So big data set. Now, there are a number of patients that we couldn't link up for various reasons, predominantly people who came into ICU first and then went off for cardiac surgery. Uh, but over 25,000 patients is a pretty reasonable thing to do. So we thought, is this Arctic, is it a valid statistic? And the first thing that we did was just look at the patients that had high levels, the patients who had got more risk. And it seemed to make sense. They were the patients that had longer bypass times, needed balloon pumps, had blood products transfused, needed a ventricular assist device put in. There were also some patients whose risk went down, who were less sick when they arrived in the ICU. And they were the patients who got antifibrinolytics. There are also patients who are more likely to be operated on by a consultant surgeon, because that was available in the data set. It doesn't tell me who the surgeon is, it just says a, it was a consultant. So it seemed that this was a valid, a valid statistic. So then we thought, well, let's take it a little bit further. Um, <clears throat> can we use this to differentiate cardiac surgical units? And <clears throat> This, this morning, Andrew Wolf put up funnel plots. People are familiar with funnel plots now of cardiac surgical outcomes. This is the cardiac surgical funnel plot for Australia and New Zealand that cardiac surgical units will receive now. Except I've put five years' worth of data in there, and there's still no variation. Okay? You cannot detect variation if you just look at the standardized mortality ratio. However, if I do that for Arctic, there's two units that stick out. Suddenly stick out as being more, as having higher Arctic levels, higher increases in risk for their patients. So, you know, who here has been asked by someone, a colleague, oh, my granny's going to have a valve done. Do you know someone good to go to? But even when we looked at it on, on a yearly basis, the same two units turned up as outliers multiple times. So we looked a little bit further. Those units, <coughs> there were some baseline differences. They were small, but they were statistically significant. Those outlier units had slightly less, val slightly less coronary artery bypass surgery and slightly more valves and slightly more diabetics. But when you looked at the outcomes of those patients, the outcomes were huge and they weren't accounted for by, those vari by that variation in the outcomes of, those, uh, of the patients turning up there. And those two outlier units had more strokes, had more acute renal failure, had more returns to theatre, and had prolonged, more prolonged ventilation than the other units. So all of a sudden we have a single number that can differentiate these two units and can differentiate them on the basis of morbidity when mortality can no longer do it. So we thought, let's take it a little bit further. So it seemed to work for differentiating units. But the great thing about the cardiothoracic registry data is that unlike ours, the cardiothoracic registry data has just been linked with the death index. So we could look at long-term mortality outcomes for these patients. We broke them into three, three groups. We broke them into the low-risk elective cardiac surgical patients and if you're a low-risk patient and you've got a high Arctic score, so you, you've got more risk when you've got more, you got sicker when you turned up in the ICU, you're less likely to be alive five years later. If you're a medium-risk patient, you're less likely to be alive five, six years later. And they, the lines diverge even more. And if you were a high-risk patient when you came in, the lines are massively different. <coughs> So this single figure can actually tell, tell you information about whether that person, person's going to be alive five or six years later. Not only that, it, it also sort of conceptually, it's, it's showing me things that make sense, that your cardiac surgical unit's performance really matters if you're a high-risk patient. It's sort of conceptually right, it makes sense to me, and has a much bigger effect not just on your short-term outcomes, but on your long-term survival five, six years later. And if we look at it in just a different way, the individual, if you look individually at whether these things can predict mortality at five years, if you're in the highest group of Arctic patients, you're about four or five times more likely to be dead at five years. <coughs> 
So suddenly we have one number that we can measure by taking two data sets on every single patient that can give us information whether that person is going to be alive five or six years later. So it seems to be a useful, it seems to be a useful statistic. Now, <clears throat> it, before I sort of go on about it too much, it, it's new and untested. This is a concept that hasn't been tried out in any sort of medical field that we know of yet. Um, there's about 4,000 patients that we couldn't match up, so don't know what the, how much they would have affected things. We've got two separate registry groups that would involve routinely linking their data, and we haven't worked out how to do this yet. It's actually a marker of the whole perioperative care, not just an individual surgeon or anaesthetist or ICU's performance. It's a whole perioperative care. And it, could, it probably needs validation in other cardiothoracic populations. And Tim Coulson, who's the person who's really done this work, is actually in Papworth at the moment as an anaesthetic registrar, planning to hopefully do this work with the UK group and replicate this same methodology to see if it still works over there. But ha that having said, this concept of an acute change in in, in risk appears to be valid and discriminatory and have a relationship to long-term outcome and may be applicable to other medical and surgical procedures as well. Thanks very much. This is somewhat facetious, but is there a scoring system for cardiac surgical personality? <laughs> because my anecdotal experience is that the nice guys tend to be the better surgeons. <laughs> Has anyone had that experience? Uh, anecdotally, I'd probably agree with you. If you actually re re read Samir Nashef's book, they actually attempt to measure um, both uh, personality traits and um, tiredness and stress levels in surgeons and see how those affect people and the effect of holidays as well. So, read the book. Any other questions? Justin Demick and the group, um, one of the groups in the States has done some brilliant work actually videotaping people doing routine surgeries. Basically, you put a Google Glass on the surgeon and you just watch what they do. And then you, compare, you show that to surgeons. And it turns out surgeons have incredibly high inner rate of reliability when they judge how good each other's hands are. You can imagine that as a very nice way to help unpack what's going on here. And in particular, it seems like the big question is, how much of this is the surgeon's fault and how much of this is the anesthetist's fault? Yeah. Yeah, it would be, it, it, it would be really interesting to have a look. That has actually been looked at, actually. This work doesn't show you, show you that. The, if you look at cardiac surgical outcomes, the majority of the outcomes are actually r related to the patient's baseline characteristics, sort of 70, 80 percent. Then the most, the, most of the remaining is the surgeon, and about three percent is anaesthetist. So th there's been an attempt to actually do that. It's very cool yeah. work. So yeah, hi, um, uh, George. Just to answer your question, is there, there is uh, work that's come out of Vanderbilt University in the States that has shown that um, surgeons who are dickheads do very <laughs> well with low risk surgery, but with high risk surgery, their outcomes are worse. And that is because it plays into the team dynamic and the flow on it. So that has been shown. So I'm a surgeon. So I can say those things. Besides an intensive. David Tripp from Wellington. This is assuming that outcomes from surgery are all about the surgeon and not about what ICU does. Mm -hmm. Is there a way you could turn the data around to actually look at our contribution to, to, to outcomes? In particular, if the cardiothoracic data has got long-term outcomes and measures of morbidity and renal failure and all the rest, could you take the low-risk people when they turn up at ICU and look at the subsequent outcomes from the cardiothoracic database yeah. and mortality and see what our contribution to goodness or badness is? Uh, yes, you can, you can. And actually, a bit of information that I didn't show. I mean, in theory, because the Apache score isn't taken at the moment the person comes into ICU, it's taken from all the variables in the first 24 hours. There's a component of the things that we do to the patient within ICU that will be captured by this already. However, when we, when we looked at the Apache SMRs for, and I didn't put the Apache SMRs up, I put the the SMRs that were based on the original turning up at, at hospital OSCORE SMRs. One of those two outlier hospitals is actually a good outlier on the other side of the curve. So it's a, to me, that suggests for that hospital that maybe the ICU is compensating 
for less good cardiac surgical performance. Um, they're things that we're just starting to unpack with this because you know each time we look at it we find another thing thing so we only just realized that just recently when we actually came to do it but you're right separating out the cardiac surgical unit performance from the icu performance is an important thing to do and po possibly is possible theoretically with this sorry Jay, this will be really 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 stupid question i'm sure it's when <laughs> when old canals was putting together apache do you remember it was never good for um coronary artery bypass grafting then we start to include valves in the um in our reporting so how good a tool actually is apache 2 or apache 3 or apache 3j as we currently use for that subgroup of patients uh Sorry, it, 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 no, it, it's not a stupid question. In fact, it's actually you, you're probably asking the question that probably a lot of people are, are thinking because they're going. I don't think you're meant to be using Apache three for, for cardiac surgery. What are you doing? Um, uh, it, there was a, there was a, an algorithm released for a cardiac surgery in I think 2007 2008. So it actually does exist. Having said that, we didn't use that algorithm in this. We just used the score itself, and the score is actually pretty. Pre predictive and it works as well in cardiac surgery as it does in the rest of our patients and it had an area under the receiver operator characteristic of 0.86 for the statsy type people which is actually slightly better than the cardiac surgeon's own score but you might expect it to be a bit better because it's a bit closer to the eventual outcome so um, so it, it actually works okay is, is what it does. Ian. Yeah, on that statsy nerdy sort of thing the area, the area of the curve was only 0.79 for the cardiac one yep. It doesn't look like a brilliant, brilliant model. It may be that it's missing things about the person's protoplasm that become pretty evident in theatre. Um, yeah, therefore, they turn up looking like a high-risk patient when they come in, th in the first 24 hours in ICU. That was missed by the by the cardiac by the cardiac surgical scoring system. Yeah, I think it, you're quite possibly right, and that was actually one of the things that concerned us. And in particular, diabetes isn't in that score. So <clears throat> when we've done this we, we've taken their original score because we thought look if we're ever going to use this it'd be simpler just to take the two scores but we've actually tested it by pulling in additional data like diabetes and things to see whether it makes a difference it, it, in, in the inf with the information that we've got adding in diabetes and the other comorbidities that we had information about didn't change the way that this works but you, your comments probably still very valid because there's probably a whole load of other things from I don't know a frailty assessment to a you know all sorts of other medical comorbidities that we don't have information in that would provide adequate and better risk adjustment. It's Andrew. quite day. Assuming this works, and obviously it might well work, um, at some stage, if you sold this to administrators, would you actually have the name of the operator rather than consultant versus registrar? So you could actually identify an operator that consistently either goes up or goes down? Uh, there's, there's two, I suppose there's two, two parts to the answer for that. Um, it, it would be theoretically possible to get a score by each individual operator. So it's theoretically possible to, to do that. Now whether you actually report that back is, a, is more of a question on what's the right governance for this, for this process. And that's analogous to the way in which we report the sort of ICU outcomes. So depending on the region of the country, we report ICU outcomes. Um, they're identified to the individual unit, but de-identified against your comparison. Now, um, <coughs> that those sort of things would need to be worked out later on down, down the track. Surgeons already get individual surgical performance reports back. So particularly for higher risk surgery, so, and this is cardiac surgery is in, in there, this isn't a new concept to them. So this would be, I guess, a modification of that, but how it would actually happen and who would be, who would have access to that kind of thing would be determined by the governance model for, for using it. I mean, because we all know anecdotally wet surgeons versus dry surgeons and things, and, and I guess really this would confirm that, I assume. Oh, look, it, it would give you an individual marker of surgical performance. I mean, they, the cardiothoracic registry was very careful not to give us individual surgeons. They do have that, but they made a point of not giving that. They actually made a point of, of linking up the, the data. So I, 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 I shouldn't admit to this, but I obviously, as soon as I saw those two units, I wanted, I wanted to know who those two units were. <laughs> 
but I can't tell from that data. I can only tell which my unit is. Um, <coughs> but I was very interested to see that they had consultant and non-consultant. And the non-consultant scores are much worse than the consultant scores. So I think there's a, there would be valid information there. Thanks very much, David. Fantastic number of questions generated.